Pastor Chris is uh, at a tournament today. He'll be back here next week, but for now, you're stuck with me. Um, before we get into our, our main text today, I just wanted to take a moment, because the title of the message is uh, Weapons of War, and I did not intend that to be like clickbait type stuff with what's going on, but um, with the events that have been playing out in the, in the Middle East, uh, I know I personally have had a, a couple different messages and, and discussions pointed uh, pointed toward me, uh, asking about you know is this biblical prophecy unfolding in, in before our eyes? And some you know one person in particular was really frightened by all of it, and uh, I'm a little loud back there. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute and talk about it. Okay, so some of the the players that we see in Scripture and prophecy about the end times um, have been saber-rattling, right? Russia, uh, Iran, and China are all kind of mentioned in, in different passages and different sections. Um, and so that can have people concerned. Although, look at a time in history where they have not been doing that, and you'll, you'll struggle to find it. Uh, then, you know, of course, we've got the, the U.S. Uh, uh, Gerald R. Ford just parked off the coast of Gaza. That's the biggest ship we have in the U.S. Navy. And I have a brother that serves in the Navy, so that's of concern to me. Um, here's the deal. is I think, you know, we're seeing things put into motion that can set the stage for what comes next. Maybe. But here's what I know, is that there is some prophecy playing out, uh, because the Bible prophesies that there will be strife between the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, always, until, until Jesus comes back, basically. Uh, so here's what I know. God has a special plan for the land and the people of Israel. That's true, that matters. Uh, I also know that Satan loves to make us view other people as, um, as enemies and as less than human. And Jesus loves and died for uh, the people inside and outside of the Gaza Strip. So, I also know that when Jesus returns, uh, one of the things that he's going to do is put an end to war and all this nonsense. So there, there's where we're at. Is this the, like the final days you need to start hoarding bullets and beans? Not yet. Uh, but we'll keep you posted. All right? Uh, in the meantime, I want to take a moment and we'll pray about that and then we'll get into our main text, okay? Lord, we, uh, we just thank you this morning for giving us this opportunity to gather together. And Lord, we just want to lift up, we want to pray for all the men, women, and children uh, affected by war and violence this morning. We pray for their protection. We pray for peace. We pray that, you, that they would call on your name and be saved. And Lord, we pray for your will to be done there, here, on earth as it is in heaven, and for your kingdom to come. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, Paul is, he's on his way back from Macedonia, uh, on his way to Jerusalem, right? And on that journey, he has been, along the way, he's been collecting, asking the churches to collect an offering to help out the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and so Pastor Chris went over some of that text last week where Paul was telling them about being cheerful givers and all that stuff. Um, while he's been away, he's heard about some criticism of himself, of questioning his authority and his leadership. He's the guy that planted the church. He, you know, before Paul came to Corinth, no one had heard the gospel. Paul came, preached the gospel, people were saved, he started a church, he hung out there for a time, and then he went on and, and did the next city and, and the next church. Uh, so in the meantime, some wolves have kind of worked their way in amongst the sheep, and they're, they're causing trouble. And so one of the things that people are bringing up about him in his letters, because he's written 
We're in 2 Corinthians. Uh, some people think there was even a 3 Corinthians that we don't have. But he's written some letters addressing the mess back in Corinth. And one of the things that people are bringing up is how in his letters have a different tone than how he behaves in person. Okay, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, it says, For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. So they say, they're basically accusing him of being like, like our version of, would be like an internet troll, right? Those, those keyboard warriors, you know, that, that you know them. There are people in your life who talk a big game on Facebook, right? But in person, they're a lot different than, you know, when there's no one around uh, to challenge them, they'll, they're a little bolder than they are in person. I talked to my, one of my sons about that. He was kind of falling into that trap of, you know, saying, kind of talking trash on the Internet. And I said, you know, the problem with your generation is you've grown up without the fear of violence. Um, because prior to the Internet, if you wanted to say smart aleck things about people, you could. You run the risk of getting punched in the mouth, you know. Uh, you couldn't hide behind an anonymous username. So that is not at all what Paul is doing, right? But that's what they're accusing him of. They're like, hey, he writes these bold letters, but when he's here, he's just like nice and soft-spoken, and his speech is actually contemptible. He doesn't seem that wise when we're talking to him in person. But that's the thing, is that good leaders don't throw their weight around. They help you carry your weight. They, they're, you know, if you have to raise your voice to make your point, you're not making your point. Right? You're just overpowering someone. And so he addresses that criticism head on. We'll, we'll get into our main text here. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1. He says, Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. He says, I know what you're saying about me. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous uh, against someone who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. So he doesn't have a problem admitting that, uh, that yeah, in person, I am unimpressive. I'm just a guy. Uh, even his name meant little. In his first letter to to the church in Corinth, he said this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. He says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. He says, I, did, I didn't come with just clever, this pre-rehearsed speech that would be so impressive that I had it all memorized and everything. I came preaching the gospel because I didn't want you to be impressed by me. I want you to hear the truth. And so he's saying to, to the church in Corinth now, he says, I'm writing, I write to you using strong words, but when I'm with you, I'm being meek, and gentle, like Christ. I'm trying to be like Jesus when I'm with you. I don't want to have to be bold and in your face when I visit. Some of you maybe have had this experience where you have this long day at work, and and you know, all you want to do when you get home is is relax and maybe hug and play with your kids, and you get home and find out they are waiting for you because they're in trouble. You know what I'm talking about? That. Someone pulled the wait till your mother gets home or wait till your dad gets home. And you're like, oh, that's the last thing I want is the little bit of time I spend with you. I don't want to be, have, I don't want to have to be harsh with you. I'm going to, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to do that. Well, with what little time we have together, I don't want to spend it being harsh with you is what Paul's saying. But he says, I'm trying to spend our time together. I want to be meek. Like Jesus. 
Now, that's a phrase that feels strange to us, right? That, you know, Jesus, he only ever gave a couple of autobiographical statements about himself, about his personality. And one of them was this. In Matthew 11, verse 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, or meek, your Bible may say, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And we like that. We like those paintings of people, you know, the kids sitting on the lap of Jesus, or Jesus like petting a, a lamb, and, you know, he's so gentle. Uh, but meekness is not weakness. Okay, it's a different word. This word in the Greek, it's uh, praos, and it, it means power under control. It was a, a, a term used to describe the breaking of a horse. You take this wild stallion that's, you know, uh, full of, uh, you know, rage and power and all of that, and then you tame it. It's still capable of all of that, but it's a powerful creature under the control of its master. And a meek person is a powerful person under God's control. That's what Jesus was, and that's what Paul was trying to be. Jesus was meek, but he wasn't weak. He wasn't a wimp. All right, in Matthew 26, when, when they come to arrest Jesus, verse 51, it says, Behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? And we talked about that text before, right? We know one angel wiped out 185,000 people in one night in one account in the Old Testament. So that many angels could do a lot of damage. Jesus says, you think I couldn't handle myself if I wanted to? Now John, when he gives the account of them coming to arrest Jesus, he, he gives us another little detail that I just, I don't need it for this message. I just love this story. John 18, verse 3, says, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And so Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with him. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. When Jesus says, I'm your huckleberry, <laughs> they all like are blown away. They fall down at the sound of his voice. And when Jesus returns, we're told that it's, a sword comes from his mouth. Right, the, he, He's going to speak and wipe out uh, his enemies. But anyway, the point is, with all the resources of God, he could blink someone out of existence. Jesus refrained. He had power under control. There are times when you could crush someone with your superior knowledge. There are times when you could physically take someone down. Right? That's tempting when someone's ticking you off. You know, a little choke slam never hurt anybody too bad, right? <laughs> there are times you could do that. Or you could overpower someone with your voice, like I mentioned earlier. Right? I'm going to make it seem right by being louder than you. But that's how the world does things. That's how the flesh does things. It's not how kingdom-minded people do things. It's not how Jesus does things. Remember, Jesus said that blessed are the, the gentle, the merciful, and the peacemakers. Not the peacekeepers, the peacemakers. People who go out of their way to make peace. So anyway, Paul says, you know, you're, you're accusing me of these things, and, and you're people who walk in the flesh, and I'm trying to not do it that way. And so, yeah, it, it may seem different to you. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war 
according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, or strongholds, your Bible may say. If you're a history buff, uh, or if not, you're going to get this story either way. One of the things that fascinates me is uh, World War I, you have this juxtaposition of old world tried and true methods versus new technology, new methods. On the same battlefield, there were uh, cavalrymen, men on horses with swords, and tanks, right? Uh, there were people with single bolt action rifles against machine guns. There was chemical warfare that no one had ever experienced before, or at least not on that level. Uh, there were planes in the sky, things that didn't exist 15 years earlier, dropping bombs. There were old weapons that weren't ready, weren't made for this war. And... Uh, Many of the castles, the fortresses, the strongholds that had stood for centuries were destroyed in that war with those new weapons. They were hit with mortar fire and, and cannons. and uh, Some of them held up, but most of them were destroyed. Paul says, this message, these words that I'm bringing, is a new kind of weapon. You can't win this war using the same old weapons and the same old methods you've always used. You know, right now, whether you realize it or not, you uh, just simply by hearing the word of God are being changed. It brings about a work of God in you. Well, it doesn't mean you walk out of here a brand new creature fully, you know, glowing with holiness or whatever, but like it or not, when you hear the word of God, it does something. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God's word can bring about transformation. The word changes things. And especially when we, we hear the word and then we put it into action, real change happens. There's an old saying that, you know, you uh, keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you got, right? Well, the old way, those old weapons, our old methods, uh, have led to broken promises and broken relationships. Uh, the old way led to yelling and throwing things. The old way left you frustrated and, and looking for somebody to blame. But you, if you've trusted Jesus, you've been made new. We just talked about that a few weeks ago, right? You're this new creation. Old things have passed away. New things have come. We're going to try and do things different. The new you is going to use these new weapons at your disposal, and you're going to continue to remodel and renew your mind uh, with the Word. So in this text, Paul, he's talking about spiritual versus fleshly things, worldly things versus godly things. And, and we like to talk in the, in the church about spiritual warfare. And spiritual battles um, are not always about casting out demons and stuff from horror movies. Like, like we, we like to envision this stuff where we get into an argument and there's an angel on my shoulder and a demon on your shoulder and they're sword fighting and, you know, and maybe, maybe some of that happens. But that's not what he's getting at. Now, he talks about that elsewhere, but more than anything, Satan wants to bring division, right? He wants you to view most things as uh, non-spiritual, this one doesn't count. This isn't one of the big ones. You don't need to bring God into this. He wants you to believe that the person you're angry with uh, is your enemy. Right? That your spouse is your enemy. That your coworker is your enemy. 
and he wants you to respond to your enemy in the flesh. C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a little book called The Screw Tape Letters. It's a great read. It's short, but it's, uh, it's this imaginary correspondence between an older devil uh, or demon named Screw Tape uh, with his young nephew who's just getting started in the field. Uh, his name is Wormwood. And so he's giving him advice of, you know, giving him a little, giving us a little picture of what goes on behind the veil, I guess. And he says this, he says, uh, you will say that these are all very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy, God being the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. So we like to, we like to blame the devil for things. Uh, and yes, he wants to destroy you. The Bible is very clear on that. Uh, but the Bible is also clear that he has to ask permission to mess with you. Did you know that? In Job, we see him, uh, he asks God for permission to afflict Job. Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he, he tells Simon Peter, he says, Satan has asked for you. Right? He's been asking after you. One theologian put it this way, that God only, uh, God only gives the devil just enough rope to hang himself. You know, that, that basically that... Uh, Whatever the devil does in your life, God wants to use that to turn that around for your good, to, you know, to redeem it in some way. Because like at the cross, Satan thought he won, right? He's probably pumping his fist like, we got him, right? Not knowing that he's, he's just brought about his own destruction. So yeah, he's a real thing. Uh, evil's a real thing. Uh, we, there is an enemy, and it is at work. Paul talks about it a little bit in Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 12. He says, Our struggle is not against uh, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand Firm, And then he goes on and he talks about like the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Like that's our offensive weapon is God's Word. But then in verse 18, after he lists all those things, and remember, Paul is, uh, though he wrote in, in Greek, he, um, he, you know, grew up under a Jewish tradition and the way they wrote... Whenever you gave a list of things, the last thing is the most important thing. So he lists all those things, and then verse 18 he says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. He says, yes, you have an offensive weapon, but make sure you're praying. So yes, the, the devil's real, there's real spiritual stuff going on around us. But Paul is more concerned with making sure you understand that everything counts, everything is spiritual. Right? Before you respond in the flesh, take a moment and pray. And see if things don't just go a little different. Before you say the thing you want to say, just pray about it for a second. Before you send out that text, pray about it. You might find that you're like, dang it, I have to delete that text, right? I'm not going to send it. But very often, we don't do that. We listen to the wrong voice. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is 
I am my own worst enemy. My flesh wants what is worst for me. There's a recent study done that found that uh, if 100 people are prescribed a medication, roughly one-third will not even pick it up from the pharmacy. Of the 67, I think is what it's, yeah, 67 who do pick up their, their prescription and they take it home, half of them won't take it correctly. They'll either not take all of it or take it at the wrong times. And that even included, uh, this was even true of people on anti-rejection meds for organ transplants. Like, that's important, right? And there was a good chance they either didn't pick it up at all or didn't take it right. The only outlier, there was one type of prescription that had almost 100% like great response, was done well. It was veterinarian prescriptions for pets. We care more for our pets than we do for our own selves. Because like, what we do is rather than taking our medication, we, we know better than the doctor. We self-medicate, right? We numb ourselves through whatever it is, drug, drugs or alcohol or social media, or maybe you do a little retail therapy. You know, It feels good just knowing there's another package coming. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced the UPS guys think Gana and I are like drug dealers or something. The amount of boxes that come to our house, they're like, something fishy is going on here. In fairness, we order stuff for the kids' ministry and stuff, but yeah, we, we order plenty of stuff for ourselves. Uh, net, Netflix binging, that, you know, watching that show and you're like, one more episode, and before you know it, you're like, one more season, you know. <laughs> Anything that gives you that dopamine hit in, in an easy way is probably not great, right? It's probably something that is trying to kill you. Your flesh wants to destroy you and wants to kill you. They say everything happens for a reason, and sometimes the reason is that you're stupid and you make bad decisions. Sometimes it's not that the devil did it, it's that we're taking the short, easy dopamine hit and we're walking in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we'll see if we can get through a few more verses here. It says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and we're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. It says, we're taking every thought captive. You know, Proverbs 23, I think it's like verse 6 or 7, says that as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Your thought life matters. And I'm not saying, you know, we're not, I don't want to talk about the power of positive thinking or, or whatever, but, but I, I did look into this a little bit. You know that the average American has, I don't, I don't know how they tested this, but the average American has about 500 negative thoughts per day and each of those thoughts lasts approximately 14 seconds. So that's 1.8 hours a day of negative thought. Um, yeah, I don't know how they tested that. But, uh, but So that's 1.8 hours a day of fear and worry and shame and anger and blame and criticism and... You get it. So, you know, if you're looking for negative things, you will find them. When you get into that negative headspace... It soon becomes all that you can see. And I know my mind especially tends toward negativity. So it's just always been like that. Uh, when I catch myself in a spiral, I need to take that thought captive, he says. Right? You do have control over your thought life. Talk to God about it. Get his word in there. Let him talk to me. And more than anything, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit, right? When I'm weak, he is strong. I can do things through him that I can't do on my own. So he, he says we're going to take every thought captive, 
and especially against the speculations and lofty things that are raised up against the knowledge of God. You know, he's, he's talking about there are people in lofty places and intellectual uh, hallways and, and, you know, the, the, the pedestals that are going to raise up things against God. And I think we see that today, right, with woke culture and, and the educational system and stuff. There are things that are being raised up against God. And he says, you know what, we're going to... We're going to war against that stuff, but we're going to do it in the spirit, not in a fleshly way. So this armor that we're going to put on, these new weapons, our prayer and word, uh, the word of God, are vital to dealing with intellectual arrogance and woke culture and all that. If, if you go up against that in a hostile way, you are losing the battle. Right? When people say awful things about your Savior, it doesn't impress them to then act awful toward them, right, and just prove their point. So Paul, he says, look, I'm willing to take the hit. Uh, I'm, I'm willing for you guys to, to not be a fan of me. I'm willing to be unpopular to say the thing that you don't want to hear, uh, whatever it takes to help you grow into who God would have you be. Right, that's, that's where we're at. Now, as the rest of this chapter goes on, and Pastor Chris is going to get into this next week, uh, more than likely, but it, he, as the, the rest of the chapter, he confronts his critics again. But for now, I'm going to go back and read a couple verses we read earlier, and we'll see if we can't wrap it up. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of of fortresses. He says, you keep our perspective here. What fortresses, what strongholds has the enemy been able to establish in my life? That addiction or that broken relationship that can't possibly be healed. The hardness in my heart towards certain people. Maybe that tower of pride that keeps me from learning or, or being able to listen to certain people. The quiet desperation that you've, you've come to just accept as the way it is. What if you approached that differently this week? What if every problem... I encounter this week is spiritual. What if you prayed before you spoke? What if I, I read the word and listened to worship songs before I go into that meeting? What if instead of fighting the same fight again, the same way I've always fought it, what if I asked Jesus to fight for me? Well, the Bible tells us that, you know, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, he died for you. He fights for you. He is for you. Bring him into everything this week and see if it doesn't turn out a little different. Let me pray for you. Lord, we ask this morning that, uh, that you would remind us that every battle is a spiritual one. Lord, we need you at work. We need you at home. Help us to resist the enemy, to see who the real enemy is, and help us to lean into you. Lord, we, we pray that you would continue to transform us into who you would have us be. And God, we pray for your will to be done. And Jesus, that you come and come quickly. And all God's people said, amen. Ready?